Containers. To begin with, let's consider the main points of discussion for today. We'll start with determining what virtualization is and exactly how it works. Afterwards, we'll discuss containers, how they work, and what's all the fuss about them. We'll then move to discover what Docker and Kubernetes are and the differences between them. Finally, at the end of this video, we'll discuss the most common use cases of virtualization and containers. What is virtualization? Just a little over two decades ago, companies would most often have to use the dedicated hardware servers for applications, services, and user. At the time, such a configuration ensured that all the applications had all the resources necessary for their proper work. However, such a scenario had some serious drawbacks, like complicated infrastructure management, large hardware footprint, and all the way up to severe downtime if there were several applications running on a server and one of them needed updating. Virtualization, on the other hand, allows us to abstract the resources from the physical hardware layer and distribute them across multiple instances and virtual machines. Virtualization is a technology that lets you create and enjoy a significantly broader and more diversified set of IT services than you would otherwise traditionally be able to if you were hardware bound. Namely, virtualization allows you to optimize your physical machine's resources and abstract and redistribute them among many users or environments, thereby engaging the machine's full capacity. Virtualization is overseen by software called hypervisors, which separate the physical resources from the virtual environments so that every layer uses only specifically allocated resources. Hypervisors can be deployed on top of an operating system, like on a laptop, or be installed directly onto hardware, like a server. The latter is how most businesses choose to virtualize. What is hypervisor? Virtualization is possible only with a hypervisor. A hypervisor is the software or firmware layer that creates the possibility for multiple operating systems to run side by side while accessing the same physical server resources. The hypervisor orchestrates and separates the available resources like computing power, memory, storage, and so on, allocating a specified portion to each virtual machine as needed. The most used hypervisors nowadays are ESXi from VMware, Hyper-V from Microsoft, KVM from Red Hat, and formerly known as Zen Server from Citrix. What is a container? When we talk about a container, we talk about a lighter weight, more agile way of leveraging virtualization. Rather than spinning up an entire virtual machine, a container neatly packages only the essentials needed to run a small piece of software. A container would normally include all the code, its dependencies, and even an operating system. This enables applications to run almost anywhere, on a desktop computer, a traditional IT infrastructure, or in the cloud. Containers largely make use of operating system, or OS, virtualization. Put simply, they leverage certain features of an OS to isolate vital processes and control the access of those processes to CPUs, memory, and disk space. What are Docker and Kubernetes? Docker is an open platform for developing, distributing, and running applications. Docker grants the ability to separate applications from your IT infrastructure in order to deliver software quickly. In other words, Docker provides the ability to package and run an application in a container. With Docker, you can manage your infrastructure similarly to how you organize your applications. Now, let's look more closely at Docker's architecture. Docker uses what is known as a client-server architecture. The Docker client talks to the Docker daemon, which is responsible for the hard work of building, distributing, and running Docker containers. The Docker client and daemon can run on the same system, or the Docker client can be connected to a remote Docker daemon. The Docker client and daemon talk to each other using a REST API, a network interface, or communicate over Unix sockets. There's also Docker Compose, 
which is another form of a Docker client that lets you work with applications that consist of a set of containers. Now, let's briefly go over each component of the Docker architecture separately. The Docker daemon listens for Docker API requests and manages Docker objects, such as images, containers, networks, and volumes. Additionally, it can also talk to other daemons to manage Docker services. The Docker client is the primary gateway for users to interact with Docker. When users use commands, the client relays them to the daemon, which then carries them out. The client uses the Docker API to issue commands. The Docker client can communicate with more than one daemon. A Docker registry is the place that stores Docker images. Docker Hub is a public registry that can be utilized by anyone, and Docker is configured to look for images on Docker Hub by default. However, you can run your own private registry if you need to. An image is a read-only template with instructions for creating a Docker container. Usually, an image is based on another image with some additional tweaking. For example, you may build an image based on the Ubuntu image, but install the Apache web server and your application and the configuration details needed to make such an application run. A container is a runnable instance of an image. You can create, start, stop, move, or delete a Docker container using the Docker API or a command line interface, or CLI. There are many things you can do with a container. For example, you can connect it to one or more networks, attach storage to it, or even create a new image based on its current state. As a standard, containers are relatively well isolated from other containers and their host. Users have the ability to control how isolated a container's network, storage, or other underlying subsystems are from other containers or the host machine. Now let's talk about Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a portable, extensible, open source platform for managing containerized workloads and services. Kubernetes is used to facilitate both declarative configuration and automation. Kubernetes provides users with a framework to run distributed systems resiliently. There's a lot it can do, like taking care of scaling and failover for applications, provision of deployment patterns, and more. Kubernetes possesses an elaborate set of features. Let's look at the most important ones. Service discovery and load balancing. Kubernetes can expose a container by way of using their DNS name or IP address. If the traffic to a container is high, Kubernetes can load balance and redistribute it to stabilize the deployment. Storage orchestration. Kubernetes allows users to automatically and easily mount any preferred storage system, such as local storage, public cloud, and more. Automated rollouts and rollbacks. You can describe the desired state for your deployed containers using Kubernetes. Then, Kubernetes can calibrate the actual state to fit the desired state at a controlled rate. For example, you can automate Kubernetes to create new containers for your deployment or remove the existing containers and adopt all their resources to a new container. Automatic bin packing. It might sound a bit weird, but in essence, it means that users provide Kubernetes with a cluster of nodes that it can then utilize to run containerized tasks. In other words, you specify to Kubernetes how much CPU and memory, or RAM, each container requires precisely. Kubernetes can then fit containers onto your nodes to make the best use of your resources. Self-healing. Kubernetes is very self-dependable. It starts containers that fail, replaces containers, kills containers that don't respond to your user-defined health check, and doesn't advertise them to clients until they are ready to serve. Secret and Configuration Management Kubernetes can be used as a safe place to store and manage sensitive information, such as passwords and SSH keys. You can deploy and update secrets and application configurations without rebuilding your container images and without exposing the secrets in your stack configuration. 
People are eager to try and compare Docker and Kubernetes. Well, we hate to break it to you, but the comparison has virtually no meaning because they're two completely different things. Docker is the platform that allows creating the container with an application in it, and then works with that application. Kubernetes, on the other hand, is the orchestration engine that allows you to handle fleets of containers. Kubernetes automatically manages the deployment, scaling, and networking of containers and container failover by launching a new one. Comparison makes sense only when we're comparing similar things. So if you're eager to compare them in a way that would make sense, then you need to compare Kubernetes with Docker Swarm, which is Docker's orchestration engine. Okay, so now we'll talk about each one of them separately. Let's take Kubernetes first. On your screen, you can see all the features that it has. Kubernetes is excellent in terms of flexibility in scaling and managing your IT environment. But like anything else, it has its own drawbacks. For example, it's really hard to learn the necessary commands to use them easily, which takes a lot of time. Also, it isn't easy to configure Kubernetes in an environment with different operating systems. As opposed to Kubernetes, Docker Swarm uses the Docker CLI to manage all relevant container services. Docker Swarm is easy to set up, has fewer commands to learn to get started rapidly, and makes it cheaper to train employees to use it. A drawback of Docker Swarm is that it binds you to the limitations of the Docker API. Use Cases of Virtualization and Containers So, now that we've covered all of that, let's address the elephant in the room. Containerization or virtualization? What's the right path for you? Virtualization enables you to run multiple operating systems on a single physical server. At the same time, Containerization lets you deploy various applications using the same operating system on a single virtual machine or server. Virtual machines are great for supporting applications that require an operating system's full functionality when you want to deploy multiple applications on a server or when you have a wide variety of operating systems to manage. Conversely, Containers are a better choice if your biggest priority is to maximize the number of servers you're using for multiple applications. Of course, you should also take your use case into consideration as well. For example, containers are perfect for tasks with a much shorter life cycle. With their fast setup time, they're a great option to consider for tasks that may only take a few hours. Virtual machines, on the other hand, are best used for more substantial tasks that require longer periods of time. It's a bit of a chore, but to fit your organization's best interests, you'll need to consider everything from the size of your operations and workflows to your IT culture and skill sets. That being said, containerization and virtualization have recently been converging in some interesting new ways that could potentially impact your decision as well. Ultimately, virtualization and containerization may both have a place in your IT strategy. Take some time for yourself and carefully consider your ultimate goals, immediate use cases, and team skill set before you decide to set down a specific path. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Tune in next time to learn about hardware server components, 